Professor Gosson. He's made a nuclear war thinkable yeah. again. That's a substantive consequence of his policy toward North Korea. I agree with you, something has changed in terms of relations with North Korea and their willingness to do certain things, but it's at the cost of making people think uh, a nuclear conflagration could happen. It's that, isn't, that, isn't, uh, that is not fair. The, the, the reason that there is a, a conceivable nuclear conflagration is that North Korea has been enabled to develop a nuclear program under the preceding presidents. But Trump has no discipline. In he, uh, his comment about nuclear war came after a golfing event at one of his Well, that's the tactics events. he's using to try and suppress it, but he the reality is nu nuclear capability is in the hands of North Korea due to the policies pursued by Obama and Bush before him, not due to the previous five months of Trump. You don't just get a nuclear weapon because you've got a, a vulgar halfway in the White House. You have to spend years doing that, and that should have been suppressed under the previous administration. Yes, yes. and a lot you of You cannot lay that at Trump's door. It's an absurdity. And but Trump is a gift that keeps on giving, not only to journalists, but to, to Kim Jong-un, because anti-Americanism is so important for keeping the support of the North Koreans and respecting and loving their leader. Honesty no, it's not a, it's What not you see honesty. is what you get. No. It's unvarnished. No. No, and this stuff about his economic achievements, look, what he's about is trying to line his pockets and the pockets of his cronies. And this tax cut bill, supposedly, the American economy is not going to survive through this. Anyone can go out and splurge a load of money immediately. <laughs> Let's see where we are in a few years' time. This is not going to work. And we know, we've seen it it's before with economics. Paul Krugman said the American economy would be in ruins by the end of his first year. It's, in, it's in never been in better health. Wait you have and absolutely see. no ever, wait and see, fine. We're not waiting and seeing. You're clearly we, delineating where, a disaster where, before it's happened. Where are all these new steel factories? Where are the, he made all these promises to people. He hasn't built an inch of the wall yet. Are you he made guys, all these promises. Is it realistic that just because he says something, snap my fingers and it should exist the next day for the uk mm -hmm. i don't agree with daniel in that uh, we shouldn't uh, invite him to the uk we should respect the views of the american people we should re respect the views of democracy and we should uh, talk to mr trump now clearly there's probably nobody in this room who could back what he says on twitter or would agree with all of his points but ultimately he is a businessman who is increasing business opportunities in the United States, and we should be taking advantage of that. I want to just explore this thing that you just picked up on there about people feeling, you know, that they're being told what to think about Donald Trump. Because, uh, Simon, when you, I think it was a news quiz that you were on, and you actually, you were on Radio 4, and you said at one point, you know, so you said a, a couple of things that were maybe things that Donald Trump had achieved, and there were positives about Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And it was a little bit of stunned silence from the yes, liberal... Yes, they're not liberal used to hearing that on Radio 4 comedy programs. So. <laughs> <laughs> liberal it was only as a counterpoint. I mean, I find him very hard to defend in conventional terms, certainly, you know. And I mean, there's, there is extraordinary... Is there a snobbery there. about this? Yeah, absolutely there is, yes. But it wouldn't even matter if there was a snobbery if these people hadn't been let down by generation after generation of professional politicians, and the Republican Party in particular, taking a huge amount of uh, potential Republican voters in America for granted, in exactly the same way that a huge number of Brexit voters were taken for granted. You can just make a little nod in the direction of abortion law and gun control, and they'll stay on side regardless of their jobs disappearing and their children spending their adult lives in an opioid haze playing Xbox all day. It's, you know, that's no future for their young people. And they were promised again and again by mealy-mouthed politicians who had all the surface gloss of Barack Obama and delivered absolutely nothing for them. So obviously, yes, yeah, sooner or later, they've turned to this, you know, old-fashioned... Uh, he's like a Burt Lancaster character from a 1950s movie. He's an extraordinary throwback to a kind of two-fisted... American vulgarian, but mm. there is part of that in the American mythos, and so far, frankly, he is delivering. Yeah, pulling out of the Paris climate change accord, he's, it, he doesn't know the difference between weather and climate. I'm going with political, uh, sorry, I'm going with scientific consensus here. But, okay, <laughs> look, 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 this is an act of environmental planetary vandalism, and our grandchildren will look back and they will say, shame on us, and they will say, shame on him. Well, they very well might, but he decided to pull out of it because that the requirements 
uh, that were on America's shoulders were far greater than that of China's and other nations, and that we were what supposed to act. taking a lead? Yeah. You know what, Donald the Trump... The free world. Donald Trump is not interested in taking a lead. It's America first, and people have a hard time with that. And, and it means that other countries who have counted on America for but, so but, but long... But, can I say, I'm so sorry. This is going to mean, ultimately, the deaths of millions of people. It's, it's, going, to mean, it's going to mean the extinction but again, you're blaming species. Trump, who's it's been in power for 12 months. This is 30 years. Margaret Thatcher spoke against global warming. You're eliminating the responsibility of Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama to do anything to slow down the pace of the change. They all signed up to a cause. Don't take it everything. out on me. I'm just asking the questions it's here. Exactly. It's like you caused <laughs> global warming with this. Good, it's been known about for 40 years. Yeah, goodness, mate. You're, you're certainly heating up. It's um, strange. So, it is, Leslie. It is strange. Many of the successes that Donald Trump is claiming on deregulation were actually begun under Obama, so I think there are some contestation over the numbers. He's pushing hard, of course, on environmental deregulation and on Dodd-Frank, the regulation that was put in place after the financial crisis to really protect from that kind of thing happening again. He's actually increased regulation on trade, so I think it's a much more complicated picture than, than what you suggest. He certainly would like to be seen as the president has deregulated in a way that's looking out for all people, but it's but far Simon, from clear that that's As you say, it's early days. Choice of an it's early own. days, right? Yes, it's always very difficult to yeah. say whether, you know, the effects are coming through from something that Obama did previously or whether yeah. it's something that's happening now. But it's a, a, I think there's certainly a sense of the direction he's travelling in. And it's interesting, this chap saying he's going to put some ideas to bed and then everybody else saying, oh, you still believe in trickle-down. Well, of course, this argument has been going on since Marx, hasn't it? Nobody knows, but it does seem statistically that the reality is that there is a, a rate of corporate tax which, cr which raises the level of total receipts. And anything above that is basically being done for ideological grounds. It's being done in order to punish people who show a bit of enterprise. And counterproductive no, quite the other way around. Kill us myth about deregulation. It was a myth. Then we wouldn't need to have this the conversation, myth, look, would we? <laughs> regulation quite often creates jobs. The most successful part of the UK economy. Yeah, it creates for many jobs people. of bloody bureaucrats no, doing many regulatory years, tackling, work. Tackling, Nobody tackling, wants those tackling, jobs. No, tackling climate change actually the green economy in this country has been the part that's done best and that's done through government regulation this deregulation myth that has taken hold has caused a lot we of have problems got. in our uk economy i think we don't have entirely equality of opportunity but as a feudalist i'm i'm not dismayed by that <laughs> i mean i think there is a natural hierarchy i think there's inequality because people are unequal and i think uh, ambitions of social mobility are usually deluded and they you know this is why we end up with upstarts like thomas cromwell the um, the basic thing that nobody ever wants to admit in these kind of discussions is that people are unequal. He says everyone can start a business. He says not everyone can start a business. You say why? Because we need people to work for business. It wasn't. It's not what. Why? It's because lots of people are not capable of it. And it's not even honest to say they don't want to. They're just not up to it. There are loads of people who just don't have that. They don't have that capacity. Being anxious about social mobility is often uh, a, a greater sign of some kind of mental disquiet than simply accepting it. Wow. <laughs> <Any problem>? wow. <laughs> Cambridge's story, though. I'm getting the feeling that Cambridge is being punished here, or at least isolated and singled out and attacked for having these huge levels of inequality, and they come from the fact that there's a lot of high-earning individuals in yeah. Cambridge rather than that there's a particular preponderance of... Of, of, uh, of less well-off people. And the high-earning individuals in Cambridge seem to be working in very worthwhile fields. Mm -hmm. Apparently, absolutely world-class life sciences and so on. They're not, these are not the bangers. I agree, you know, taking my tongue out of my cheek for a moment, I agree with you that Don't it is that. preposterous that 0.1%, it's not even the 1%, it's the 0.1% who are absolutely flying away with, like, trillions of dollars, trillions of pounds. It's an absurd situation. And if anyone can work out a way of solving that without plunging us into socialism, I will sign up to it. But <laughs> it's, it's not fair to look at Cambridge and say, oh, you're, this is disgraceful, your house prices are, are uh, many times the national average because, because you are a world centre of excellence in what was previously an unregarded well, part of the How do you fix it? People with absurd. decent jobs cannot afford to get a mortgage. But the problem cannot, is, cannot... you're talking... Well, it's with you whether you want to centralise it or not. If you have a, a centralised public sector with centralised salaries, if you have a centralised uh, welfare state, if you have a centralised notion of national insurance, then places like Cambridge are going to have inequality because the ability to create wealth is localised, but the ability to distribute it is centralised. 
And that's your problem. I mean, decide whether you want to create a, a city-state. I'll build a wall. That would be great. I mean, I would love to see, you know, Cambridge return to a Machiavellian, Jan? you know, walled citadel. That build, would be fantastic. That wall. <laughs> <laughs> build that wall. Build that wall. Simon, anymore. let's do something about that. On this central question that we have got here, um, mm. for example, you work in a world of comedy, and if there's a comedian playing in, in, in a pub every night, does, is he or she going to be spurred on by seeing the comedian who sells out at the Labatt's Apollo. Yeah, it's a very pyramidal structure, very like acting in that respect, where about 1% of actors are, are, uh, have a lifestyle which is incredibly aspirational. <laughs> yeah, about 10% have a job at any given moment. About 1% of them have what our kids think of as being what it would be like to be an actor. Yeah, absolutely, and we all accept it. And it's strange because the world of comedy is over, overwhelmingly left-wing and, and, and they preach a lot of socialism, but it's incredibly petty bourgeois. Do they live like socialists? Well, in the sense that they're poor, yes, they do, yeah. But they, they, there's a very Raskolnikov kind of aesthetic when you're in your first sort of 15 years of, of comedy. But it's, uh, it's, it's driven absolutely by, the, by the, uh, the idea that your name could be up in lights one day, yeah. It, mm. it, it's totally driven. And, of course, it is fun on the way as well. Mm.